Welcome everyone to Unit 3 on Somatic and Dissociative Disorders. This is Dr. Moore. We'll begin with Dissociative Disorders, which involve abnormality in memory, consciousness, or identity. Then we'll cover Somatic Symptom Disorders, which include conditions that involve very distressing thoughts related to bodily symptoms. The human mind seems capable of dissociating or separating mental functions. To help you relate and uh, understand this idea, let's say you start thinking intensively about a problem while you're out jogging. Then you realize you ran a mile without awareness of your surroundings. Or have you ever missed part of a conversation? Well, this splitting off of awareness will give you a sense of what is meant by dissociation. Over a hundred years ago, French psychiatrist Pierre Genet created the term dissociation to describe a state of mind in which different aspects of identity become separated. Consciousness is split, making some parts of memory and personality unavailable to other parts. This is a dramatic phenomenon, and it has fascinated the public as seen in the popularity of the movies The Three Faces of Eve, starring Joanne Woodward, and later the book and subsequent movie about Sybil. I remember one scene in The Three Faces of Eve where the main character discovered all of these fancy, extravagant clothes in her closet, and she didn't remember buying them. Sybil was a very popular movie based on a case history, which was later found to be not true. There have been books, movies, and TV shows about dissociative disorders, which gives the impression that the disorders are common. However, many clinicians believe they are extremely rare. The types of dissociative disorders are dissociative amnesia, depersonalization, derealization disorder, and dissociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder. In all of these disorders, people's conscious awareness and experiences of themselves becomes fragmented. They may lack awareness of core aspects of themselves, and they may experience amnesia for important events. Now, you need to be familiar with the different types of dissociative amnesia. Localized amnesia is a failure to recall events during specific periods of time. It's uh, similar to a blackout, however, it is not substance-induced. This is the most common form of dissociative amnesia. It can involve amnesia for traumatic events, but can also include other events as well. Generalized amnesia is a complete loss of memory for one's life history. This type is rare. Generalized amnesia may be more common among combat victims, sexual assault victims, and individuals experiencing extreme stress or conflict. Systematized amnesia is the loss of memory for certain categories of information. An example is missing all memories about a specific family member. Selective amnesia happens when someone can only remember parts of events that took place in a certain period of time. For example, an abuse victim may only remember parts of what happened or someone in a serious car accident may only recall certain portions of the accident. They remember the event, but only selective portions. Another type of dissociative amnesia is repressed memory. Amnesia may come to light only after recalling details of a traumatic event under hypnosis or during treatment. Not all researchers believe in the validity of repressed memories, and this has been a highly controversial topic because some clients are highly suggestible, and some memories may be the result of suggestions made by the therapist during treatment. Researchers have used cognitive psychology to test hypotheses about the reality of repressed memories. In a series of fascinating studies, it was found that individuals reporting repressed memories of either childhood sexual abuse or abduction by aliens have a greater tendency to form false memories during laboratory tasks. They were more likely to falsely recognize words that they had not previously seen. Some people have a tendency to create false memories, which they believe to be true. The repressed memory debate will probably continue for some time. And it's important to consider the possibility of feigning amnesia, especially by criminals to avoid prosecution.
Amnesia is seen most often in homicide cases, with between 25 and 45 percent of persons arrested for homicide claiming to have amnesia. There's no clear-cut way to differentiate true amnesias from bogus ones. Neuroimaging may help to detect head injuries that lead to amnesia. One of the most well-known cases of dissociative amnesia was in 1993. Lorena Bobbitt cut off her husband's penis after years of experiencing his abuse. She claimed to have amnesia for the act of cutting it off. She was found not guilty due to insanity. Another type of dissociative amnesia is called dissociative fugue, and this is rare. It involves confusion over one's personal identity due to the complete loss of memory of one's entire life. An individual with a dissociative fugue suddenly and unexpectedly takes physical leave of his or her surroundings and sets off on a journey of some kind. These journeys can last for hours or even several days or months. Individuals experiencing a dissociative fugue have traveled over thousands of miles and someone in a fugue state is unaware of or confused about his or her identity and in some cases will assume a new identity although this tends to be the exception. Recovery is often abrupt and complete. Some individuals who have experienced several fugue episodes decide to wear personal identification just in case this happens again. Most of us have a sense of wholeness when we interact with the world. In other words, we have an identity, a sense of who we are. Memory is crucial to this sense of identity as a link between our past and present. Without memory, we would always be starting over. With memory, our life and identity move forward. We've learned about several types of dissociative amnesia. And in order to make this diagnosis, we need to refer to the DSM-5 criteria. The main one is the inability to recall important autobiographical information, usually of a traumatic or stressful nature, that is more than just ordinary forgetting. Also, we need to have clinically significant distress or impairment. And first, we need to rule out substance use or other medical conditions and other mental disorders that provide a better explanation for the symptoms that we observe. Another dissociative disorder is depersonalization derealization disorder, and it's the most common dissociative disorder. It's characterized by feelings of unreality or being detached from oneself and the environment. The DSM-5 provides diagnostic guidelines course the symptoms cause significant impairment or distress and there's the presence of persistent or recurrent experiences of depersonalization derealization or both the first depersonalization is a detachment from oneself and the second derealization is a detachment from the environment during depersonalization or derealization reality testing remains intact and that means the person is connected to external reality. They're not psychotic. Their mental processes show a connection to the external world. They know what the weather's like, uh, what day it is, and so on. Reality testing is a term that came from Freud. In this disorder, the clients recognize their experiences as symptoms. And they see a distinction between their internal world and external reality. Now, this is not a split from reality, as in psychosis, but there is an uncomfortable separateness or unrealness. I think some description of the uh, symptoms of this disorder would be helpful. Depersonalization is the condition in which people feel they are detached from their mental processes or from their body, as if they're outside observers of themselves. There's emotional or physical numbing a distorted sense of time, or changes in perceptions. The subjective experiences may be described as feeling detached, feeling robotic, feeling as if you're in a fog, in a dream, or in a bubble. An altered sense of time is common, like time is going too fast or too slow. Remember, depersonalization is a detachment from oneself.
Derealization is a condition where people feel a sense of unreality or detachment from their surroundings. Uh, they feel dreamlike, foggy. Individuals and objects are experienced as unreal. The person may say they feel unfamiliar with the world, as if they're walking on another planet. Transient symptoms of depersonalization and derealization are actually common in the general population. In general, about one half of all adults have experienced at least one episode of depersonalization or derealization. The final dissociative disorder we'll take a look at is DID, which is bizarre and dramatic. It was formerly called multiple personality disorder, and it involves a disruption of identity caused by two or more personality states. There are alterations in behaviors, attitudes, and emotions. The cardinal symptom is the apparent presence of multiple personalities, which are called alters. The personalities take turns being in control. Each personality has a different way of perceiving and relating to the world, and each takes control over the person's behavior. Alternate personality states may appear to help deal with difficult situations faced by the primary or core personality. Child alters appear to be the most common type of alter. This may have been created as a result of childhood trauma. To help you understand this explanation, here's a description from one theorist. The little girl being sexually abused by her father at night imagines that the abuse is happening to someone else as a way to distance herself from the overwhelming emotions she's experiencing. She may float up to the ceiling and watch the abuse in a detached fashion. Now, not only is the abuse not happening to her, but she blocks it out of her mind that the other little girl remembers it, not the original self. In this way, DID has compartments which are personified and take on a life of their own. The description I just read from the theorist is compelling because in normal development, people integrate perceptions and memories they have of themselves and their experiences. In a dissociative disorder, the individual is trying to block out or separate from conscious awareness events that caused extreme psychological and or physical pain. Keep in mind that DID was rarely diagnosed before 1980 when it was first introduced in the DSM-3. The availability of diagnostic criteria made it more likely to be diagnosed. Before then, it was considered extremely rare. Now another perspective is a behavioral one, which stresses role-playing and high self-monitoring. Behaviorists actually consider the different personalities as illusions. Just consider your own behaviors in different social situations. People who are high self-monitors change their behaviors dramatically to meet each social situation. They are especially tuned in to the reactions of others and then they shape their behaviors to get the reactions they want or the reactions that are socially valued. And it's not such a big step to see how DID may be manipulative or theatrical or how a therapist may reinforce different personalities and inadvertently create symptoms. This concern over iatrogenic symptoms is a controversy over DID, as therapists may react to so-called interesting cases. Therapists tend to spend more time thinking about these cases and pay more attention to subtle verbal and nonverbal messages in these clients. DID cases are intriguing, and there are puzzles that are hard to solve. Some therapists may inadvertently influence clients to exaggerate symptoms of a multiple personality. There's been considerable diagnostic controversy over dissociative disorders. Researchers say even though DID and dissociative amnesia attracted considerable attention for a period of time, these diagnoses no longer have the public's attention and are not widely accepted by the scientific community. They have fallen out of fashion. These disorders may result from the use of dissociation to cope with traumatic experiences. 
therapists may take a psychodynamic perspective and often treat these disorders by helping people explore past experiences and feelings they have blocked from consciousness and by supporting them as they develop more integrated experiences of self and more adaptive ways of coping with stress. Hypnosis is heavily used to contact alters. This has been controversial because hypnosis leaves people in a suggestible state. Temporary dissociative symptoms are actually common experiences during periods of stress, say after a natural disaster like a tornado or hurricane, for example, and they may be culturally acceptable. The DSM-5 describes symptoms that may be the result of a syndrome called attaque de nervios, which is a culturally accepted reaction to stress in some countries. It involves periods of loss of consciousness, convulsive movements, hyperactivity, and impulsive behavior. It's a sense of being out of control. People throw fits, if you will. The attacks seem to be a response to suffering, such as uh, receiving the news uh, of the death of a close relative. Repressed memories continue to be highly controversial. Studies have found that people can be made to believe certain events occurred, or they can be made to uh, create false memories. Other studies found that repeatedly asking adults about childhood events that never really happened leads to 20 to 40 percent actually remembering and describing them in detail. Some court cases involving dissociative identity disorder have raised legal questions about the insanity defense. It has rarely been successful as a legal defense, but just consider, consider the possibility that an individual may not be responsible for actions committed while one of the alter personalities is in control. Theoretically, it is possible for one alter to commit a crime while the other alters or even the host are not aware or in control. Obviously convicting the alter means the host and all the other alters are put in prison. So related to the insanity defense, is a person with dissociative identity disorder able to control his or her mind if part of the mind has split off and is acting independently. Now when you see someone with a possible dissociative disorder, assessing suicide risk is an important part of the assessment you'll complete as a mental health professional. Self-destructive behavior is common and often the reason individuals seek or are taken to treatment. This may include self-inflicted burns or wrist and arm cutting. According to the DSM-5, 70% of outpatients with DID have attempted suicide. Assessing suicide risk is important, but also complicated when there is amnesia for previous attempts. Let's move on now to take a look at the somatic symptom and related disorders. They're characterized by prominent physical or bodily symptoms associated with significant impairment or distress. Actual physical illnesses may or may not be present. They include somatic symptom disorder, illness anxiety disorder, conversion disorder, and factitious disorder. A number of factors may contribute to the development of these disorders, as well as the dissociative disorders, so be sure you carefully study this chapter and understand how the multipath model provides explanations. Somatic symptom disorder has replaced what was formerly known as somatization disorder in the DSM-4. It involves a pattern of reporting and reacting to pain or other distressing symptoms. This pattern occurs for at least six months. It involves persistent thoughts or high anxiety about the symptoms. The person remains convinced they have a serious disease even when tests rule out illness. In about 10% of cases, Symptoms are early indications of a medical condition. A person with this disorder may worry excessively over a certain bodily sensation, such as stomach pain. They may believe the sensation indicates a serious illness, such as stomach cancer, although tests have ruled this out. 
They may go to great lengths to investigate their physical symptoms. They may see multiple doctors or pay for additional tests not covered by their insurance. It's important to remember the pain and suffering is real. It is authentic, whether or not it is medically explained. These individuals have high levels of worry about illness, and they think the worst about their health. Another diagnosis in this category is illness anxiety disorder. It is a chronic pattern of preoccupation with having or contracting a serious illness. And again, the pattern must be present for at least six months. What makes this different from somatic symptom disorder is it involves minimal or no somatic symptoms. There is a high level of anxiety and it's strongly associated with a person's cognitions or their thinking patterns. It's also known as hypochondriasis. There is a preoccupation with the idea that one is sick, along with a lot of anxiety about one's health. These individuals are easily alarmed when they hear about someone else getting sick or when they hear about an illness in the news, and their concerns do not respond to reassurance from their doctors that they are fine. Another diagnosis in this category is conversion disorder, also called functional neurological symptom disorder. It's a condition in which you show psychological stress in physical ways. The condition was named to describe a health problem that starts as a mental or emotional crisis, a scary or stressful incident of some kind, and converts to a physical problem. For example, in conversion disorder, your leg may become paralyzed after you fall from a horse, even though you weren't physically injured. Conversion disorder signs and symptoms appear with no underlying physical cause, and you can't control them. There may be motor, sensory, or seizure-like symptoms, inconsistent with any recognized medical disorder. Motor weakness and abnormal movements are the most common symptoms among children and individuals are not consciously faking symptoms. They believe the problem is genuine. There was a mysterious case reported in Leroy, New York in 2012 when several teenage girls in the same high school developed unexplained tics. The situation attracted national attention when a possible cause was thought to be conversion disorder. You can see a report in one of the videos in this unit. Interestingly, when school ended, the mysterious twitching ended. Factitious disorder is a serious mental disorder in which someone deceives others by appearing sick, or by purposely getting sick, or by self-injury. Factitious disorder symptoms can range from mild, such as slight exaggeration of symptoms, to severe, previously called Munchausen syndrome. The person may make up symptoms or even tamper with medical tests to convince others that treatment, such as high-risk surgery, is necessary. Symptoms of physical or mental illness are deliberately induced or simulated with no apparent incentive. Individuals are usually unaware of any motive. A factitious disorder is not the same as inventing medical problems for practical benefit, though, such as getting out of work or winning a lawsuit. Although people with factitious disorder know they are causing their symptoms or illness, they may not understand the reasons for their behavior. So it differs from malingering, which is faking a disorder to achieve some goal, such as an insurance settlement. If an individual deliberately feigns or induces uh, physical or psychological symptoms in another person or even a pet in the absence of any obvious external rewards, the DSM-5 diagnosis is factitious disorder imposed on another. This condition is sometimes referred to as Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Factitious disorder is mysterious and hard to treat. Treatment of somatic symptom disorders may be biological. Antidepressant medications such as SSRIs reduce anxiety and depression But medication is rarely successful by itself, so psychotherapy is helpful, and therapists can help by attempting to understand the client's view of the problem by 
demonstrating empathy and accepting the symptoms as genuine. Some therapists see somatic symptoms as a defense against awareness of underlying emotional conflicts. As researchers study the connections between the brain and the body, there's more evidence that emotional well-being affects the way people perceive pain and other symptoms. Therapists can also help by providing information about stress-related symptoms, as stress often worsens the symptoms. Before I conclude this lecture, let me remind you that this week you'll be working as a member of your team to evaluate a case. So be sure you're talking to each other and comparing notes. As I've already mentioned, the DSM-5 has made some dramatic changes. The DSM-5 criteria for somatic symptom disorders have changed. The former criteria required a more extensive history of physical complaints and many more somatic symptoms to be identified. This change creates concerns that more people could potentially be diagnosed with somatic symptom disorders. The DSM-5 also eliminated the medically unexplained documentation aspect of the criteria and focuses more on the degree of distress and impairment caused by somatic complaints. The elimination of the medically unexplained terminology creates concerns that a psychiatric diagnosis will be given to those with legitimate medical concerns about diagnosed medical conditions.